So what do you think, how do we get around some of the ecological crises of, that's being caused by capitalism? Well, the first step is to add the, so there's varying gradations of corrections that we can make to the system we live in today and its destructive tendencies. If you have an unregulated capitalism that you leave to itself, it will absolutely destroy human civilization through the ecological channel, probably in a matter of a few generations, or at least so harm the, the uh, human civilization that it becomes unrecognizable from today's standards. At the very least, therefore, you have to move to a capitalism in which you change the incentive structure and the regulatory structure so that profit and the seeking of profit is forced to be in line with ecological limits. So there are certain products that you will lay off, that you will put off limits. There are certain kinds of inputs like fossil fuels, which you'll say we have to move away from. You might still have a capitalism, but one where inputs are no longer coming or energy is no longer coming through fossil fuels. Maybe we'll use wind and solar. Maybe we'll use nuclear. It'll still be capitalism, but now it's one where you're consciously engineering what's available as an input and energy, what is not. My own view is that even that will not be enough because you're still having this unceasing, unquenchable production of endless goods, endless commodities. So you have to, in, to some degree, scale back this unquenchable thirst for goods. That will not happen as long as you're in capitalism, even a regulated capitalism. So I think the next step is to move beyond a social democratic or regulated capitalism to something like a market socialism. In a market socialism, you still have markets, you'll still have some competition, but you have the room available for people who are working in plants, who are working in hotels or factories to not blindly pursue and put profits above everything else, but weigh the importance of profits against their free time, against their health, against other things which are routinely sacrificed in a capitalist plant. Mm. And then if you can go beyond that to a more planned economy, that will probably be ideal for the, uh, for the environment. I just don't think that's possible. I don't think a fully planned economy is really something we can ever achieve. What I do know is that we can go beyond an unregulated capitalism that we have right now. We can definitely go towards a pretty advanced form of a welfare state and social democracy, and we might be able to achieve something like a market socialism. Yeah, and I think when you talk about uh, the ecological kind of crisis that we're in, there's no way that we can preach uh, consumption reduction because it's in the bylaws of capitalism that we continuously have to, you know, consume, 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 because that creates the excess that a government can spend and but whatever. So I think I agree with you in the sense that it's not going to work, right? For that you, you cannot have a capitalism in which there's a blind pursuit of profit where you also have a uh, uh, concern for the environment. At, at the very minimum, it has to be a regulated capitalism. So, and that brings me to my, you know, I've been in contact with what they call libertarians or some form of accelerationists. I don't know what you'd like to call them, but people who think that the government is the problem. What would you say to a libertarian that's trying to pin, uh, pin all the problems of society on just government? It has zero empirical basis. Absolutely zero. They live in a fantasy world. <laughs> and they, they, that's why the, the philosophy gets nowhere. It's, it's, you see among 18-year-old boys and some people in frat parties or sorority parties, or you see it in philosophical institutes that are funded by billionaires, but it has zero. It has very little traction among professional philosophers, and it has absolutely no political traction in the electoral arena, because libertarianism is the foundations of libertarianism are a fantasy world. Mm. You can, if you really think that the only evil in society is government and that the economy is a bastion of freedom, you haven't worked a day in your life. I mean, you don't, you've never experienced the arbitrary power that your boss has over you. You've never experienced the unfreedom of somebody saying to you, accept this job or starve. You've never experienced all the costs that are associated with losing a job and having to spend six, eight, ten months finding a new job, while your employer, if he lost his factory tomorrow, could basically never have to work a day in his life ever again because he has assets worth millions and millions. Yeah. Now, here's the thing about libertarianism, the dirty little secret. 
what we call libertarianism, its view of the market originated in the 18th century with people like Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations. If you read The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith is absolutely clear that the market is not a bastion of freedom. It is one in which you have the tyranny of the employers over their employees. This fiction of the freedom of the market is a 20th century fiction that 20th century libertarians invented because by now they had to deal with a socialist movement and a working class movement that was pointing to these evils. And it was because of the Cold War that libertarianism had to reinvent itself as an arm of American diplomacy and of the domestic state where it had to erase what it had always acknowledged, which is that markets are not a markets are better than serfdom. They're mm. better than slavery. They're better than what you had in the medieval world. A little bit. But if you're actually describing them and they're the degree of freedom that they have, they are absolutely rife with power imbalances. And every so-called liberal economist up until the 1940s and 50s knew this, didn't hide it. So and people like Milton Friedman and Thomas Sowell come along later and, and start making these wild, um, you know, uh, assumptions about human nature. What are some of the misconceptions that these kind of people make about human nature when it comes to... Well, I don't to think the problem there is with human nature per se. They have, I would say, an unduly narrow conception of human nature. But their basic conception is two things. One is that human beings covet liberty, that liberty is the most dearly held value that humans have. And the second one is that human beings exercise their liberty through maximizing their utility, maximizing their gains from market transactions. Now, I don't have any problem with the fact that human beings hold liberty to be dear. One of the reasons I'm opposed to capitalism is that I think it squelches liberty. It squelches people's freedom. It imposes arbitrary authority on people. Where I do think they're mistaken is in their view that human beings are basically selfish bastards. Yeah. Now, the, the way to correct that is not to say human beings are actually altruists or that there's no human nature at all. To, both of these are common uh, strategies amongst people who call themselves leftists. That's a mistake. Every human being has a very healthy sense of their material interests. Every human being wants to protect their well-being and their welfare. But you can be somebody who is um, def defending their material well-being without necessarily constantly wanting to screw over the other person. The basic, what anthropologists have sort of settled upon as a description of human nature is that you people are what's called reciprocal altruists, which means I'm willing to do the right thing. I'm not always going to be a selfish bastard. I'm willing to do the right thing as long as I'm not treated like a sucker, as long as people don't consistently take advantage of me. Now, that's an incredibly valuable discovery about human beings, because it means that if you give me a chance to be decent towards other people, I will be. It'll make me happy. But what does that mean? Don't put me in a situation where it's me or them. Now you're asking me to be an altruist. I can't be an altruist. If it's me versus them, I'm going to have to do what I have to do to protect myself. But if you put me in a situation where we can cooperate, I'm not going to look to screw other people over. I'll be happy to cooperate with them as long as I feel that they will be decent to me. That's reciprocal altruism. Interesting. So there is a human nature. It's not altruistic. It is self-regarding, but it's not self-aggrandizing. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, just some some people are just selfish. I, I don't. I can't really explain other than that. You know, it's like uh, some we people are psychotic. Some people are, that doesn't matter. You it's a spectrum. Find, yeah, but the key is what's the modal description of a human being? What is the most common orientation that people have? You build your social theories based on that, not on the exceptions, not the outliers, not the weirdos. Yeah, it's just that they always bring up terms like they they bring up uh, uh, you know evolution and stuff and saying that survival of the fittest, but. Uh, you know, Darwin also... Evolution doesn't show that. Yeah, but Ever evolution is actually an inter interweaved, uh, you know, symbiotic, you know, organisms. Look, fittest means fittest to reproduce. Right. Not strongest and nastiest. It's fittest <laughs> to reproduce. And there's actually a great deal of anthropological evidence and a great deal of work in evolutionary biology that shows that what enabled human beings be to be the fittest to reproduce was reciprocal altruism. Was this... Because why? They're moving around in small bands. If everybody in that small band is trying to screw over the other person, the species would have been eliminated because of the weakest species physically. 
The only way human beings survived was through cooperation. Mm -hmm. They have an innate ability and instinct to cooperate, as mm -hmm. long as the cooperation doesn't come at the expense of individual well-being. So the one other way in which libertarians are completely off their rockers <laughs> and out of touch with reality is that they have these bogus evolutionary arguments. And this is just middle school level philosophy. It has no connection to actual research that's going on in either the natural or the social sciences. If I had a nickel for every every gun nut with a yellow hat on and a big long beard who wanted to tell me uh, what's good, <laughs> what's better than socialism. Um, 